all you uh, veterans out there from all wars, I'm going to be sharing my story about my experience in Vietnam. My name's Dennis. I'm 69 years old. I'm from Visalia, California. And I went into the military in 1969. But to build up to that, I want to talk about the reason I went to Vietnam. I wasn't drafted. I actually joined, but there was a reason I joined. Um, a friend of mine, his name was Rick, informed us he was going to Vietnam. Well, we didn't know what the heck Vietnam was. We were high school seniors. We were up swimming in the river, drinking beer, and he sprung that on us. And we all asked, well, what the heck's that about? And he goes, well, I got drafted and I have to go. And so we said, wow, man, that kind of sucks. So anyway, he takes off and he goes to Vietnam. And I think that was in like 1967, I think, because he was a year older than me. So anyway, we you know we went about our business. We hung out with each other and did what high school kids do. And Rick was engaged to this young girl. And we found out later that Rick had been killed over there. And we all like freaked out. What do you mean Rick's, you know, what do you mean Rick's gone? Yeah, he got killed over there. And so my best friend, Rick was one of my best friends, but my best friend Butch and I, we just like went, went off. We went crazy. We could not believe that. And we were young, crazy kids, so we were, you know, we talked about it and we said, dude, you know what? We need to go over there. We need to go over there and kill them suckers that killed them, not knowing what we were talking about. But we were going to go revenge Rick's death. So we finished high school, started working at a car wash, and we, you know, we've been talking about it all along while we worked at the car wash. Finally, we got up the nerve to say, you know what, let's let's do that. We don't like this car wash anyway. Let's go. Let's go do something. So we went and joined both of us. We joined the army and they accepted us. We took all the tests and all that stuff. And so I'm grieving my one of my best friend's death. And at that time, I didn't know how he was killed over there. All we knew he, he was killed. So uh, Butch and I were, were, you know, just biding our time, waiting for our date to go into the boot camp. And so one night after partying, we're laying out and I had a little separate room from the house, a separate room. And we're laying out in my bed and my mother walks in and I knew something was wrong. She said, son, she said, get in the car. We have to go to the hospital. Let's go to the hospital. Why? And she said, just get in the car. No warning, nothing. So we get in the car and she said, in fact, you need to drive fast. We need to get down there fast. She said, something's happened to dad. He's had a heart attack. So we go flying down there to the hospital, pull up into the parking lot. I'm, st I'm still in the car trying to park it. My mother had ran inside and she heard what, you know, what had happened. And she came back out before I even got out of the car. I didn't even get into the hospital. I was still outside in the parking lot. And she said, dad died. And I was like 17. And I just lost Rick, one of my best friends in Vietnam. Then I hear this and I can remember finding a big tree and punching it and just kept punching to my hands were bloody. And my mom came up and said, uh, son, me and you have to be strong for the rest of the family because I have like six brothers and sisters. And she was like in shock, you know, and we all were. But anyway, so you have to be strong. And so kind of had to try to deal with that. And then with my date coming up to go to boot camp. So I just shared that to let you know where my mindset was when we left for boot camp. So we headed to Fort Ord. No, oh, first of all, I was in jail the night I was supposed to go to boot camp. 
So my mom had to come down and get me out of jail, said, I'm the property of the United States government. You have to let him out. So they said, they made the phone call and they said, you're right, ma'am, we have to let him out. So they let me out and I went to uh, Four Door, California, uh, Monterey. It's in Monterey to show up for boot camp, Butch, my friend and I. So you can imagine 17 years old and we pull up there and these DIs are screaming, get off that bus, you stupid, dumb, blah, blah, blah. You know, you left your mother at home now and now you're ours, all that kind of garbage. Formation, stand in line. Okay, who here thinks they're tough? Get out of here. So a few guys thought they were tough and they stepped out there. Okay, you're a platoon sergeant. So are you. So anyway, we went into training and we, we did all, all the kind of training you have to do. Um, how to fire weapons, how to fire M16, M14. Uh, how to throw hand grenades, how to go through buildings and endure the gas when they throw it on you and all this kind of stuff. So one night we had a, a, a mission, I mean a training class we had to go to. So we marched, we marched everywhere. Everywhere you went, you marched. It was to get you in shape and learn how to take orders and all that kind of stuff. And so we go to this one training session and it was firing uh, 50 cal machine guns over your head while you low crawl on your back with, with your weapon and all this stuff, simulating war. So my friend and I are watching this stuff from the bleachers and everything's blowing up. You got like 10, 50 cows going off at the same time. You never heard something so loud as this. And, and we said, oh my God, let's get out of here, Butch. We're not gonna do this, this sucks. This, this I'm not crawling under no freaking machine gun rounds. Yeah, let's get out of here. So we're looking around to hide and, you know, get out of what we were supposed to do. There was no way there was GIs everywhere. They'd probably seen that happen before. People hiding under the bleachers, they're not gonna go through that. So anyway, we had to do it and oh my God, we're low crawling and stuff's blowing up. Claymore mines, simulated Claymore mines, simulated 50 cows with tracers, every fifth round's a tracer and it's at night and all you see is Red lines, red lines, red lines going over the top of these guys' heads is what it looked like from the bleachers. And like I said, stuff blowing up and, and smoke and all that. And we're wondering, what's that smoke? What's that about? Because they didn't tell you. They didn't warn you. So we get in line. We get our turn comes and we're crawling on our backs. I remember it was really cold outside. We were in Monterey, kind of rainy and, and all this stuff is going down. All of a sudden, they pop a canister and threw gas on all of us. It's CS gas. I'm trying to remember what that standard for, what that stood for, CS. Anyway, it was a powerful chemical. It'd get down in your in your pores if you were sweating. It made it worse, burned worse. So we're all sweating from all that physical exertion, crawling backwards, and this stuff gets all in our in our bodies, and it, it man, we're on fire physically. We are just lit up from this chemical gas and we're just freaking out. So we finally made it through that. And uh, so we we go on to more training, more training. And then we hear all these guys in different barracks and different companies, uh, you know, these guys we hear like a hundred of them died and we go, what? And they said meningitis. They they had an outbreak of meningitis in Fort Ord when I was there in, in boot camp. So now I'm going, Jesus, now I'm going to die before I even get to the war from meningitis. So they made us sleep with all the windows open. It had to do with the, uh, not a cure for meningitis, but gave you a better chance of not ca catching it, evidently. The medical world was figuring out, I guess, if you had fresh air all the time, there's not as many germs or whatever. So anyway, I'm all worried about that. And we're, we're like training like crazy, you know, best shape of my life. I mean, you, you train hard, you work hard. So I march, I'm coming in from a march at the end of the day, exhausted, and I'm marching up the stairs. Next thing I know, I'm blacked out. I don't, I don't know what happened. And I wake up in the hospital and find out I, I had got walking pneumonia. And I said, what the heck? And I'm, in, I'm on like 
ventilators, all this stuff up my nose, all that crap they do. IVs all over the place. And I'm thinking I got meningitis, right? What would you think? <laughs> I'm going to die like the rest of them guys. I have meningitis. No, no, doctor, you don't have that. You have pneumonia. You okay, we're going to take care of you. And so for three days, I was like out. And then I woke up finally getting better. And it's a lung disease, so my lungs were just, I couldn't even hardly breathe. So they wanted to recycle me and send me back through basic training because of this, this setback, which was about a week total. And so I asked the, my, my CEO, my captain, I said, dude, I'm not, no, no, I'm not gonna recycle, no way. I'm not going back through that again. I said, is there any way I can take this test to, to pass boot camp? So he said, let's ask the doctor. And the doctor says, hey, if he feels up to it and he wants to try it, I, I think he'll be fine. This, this kid's in great shape, physical shape. He should be okay because he's gotten past the pneumonia. So they let me do it and I passed that 100%. And so they graduated me and Butch from basic. And then our next, our next thing after, after a brief R&R, uh, &R, I think we got a week in between basics because we had to go to the next advanced training, um, advanced infantry training um, for your second basic training. Actually, is what it is. It's a, your second basic training to learn in detail your MOS. That's actually a job you do in the Army. They assign you an MOS. Infantry, you know, uh, mechanic, clerk, whatever your job's going to be, they, they give you your MOS. And so Butch and I, we were assigned to Fort Seal, Oklahoma. And we said, Fort Seal, Oklahoma, what? The? We're from California, right? It's like 30 below there, snow, and it was that time of the year. And so they, they were going to send us to Fort Seal, Oklahoma, because we were going to go to artillery training. And so I can remember getting off that bus. Oh, my God, we were like popsicles. It was horrible. We thought we were going to get a lesser situation than basic but it's kind of almost the same, a little bit different. You still pull guard, you have formations, you go through all this training for like, uh, I mean, 16 weeks of training. Pretty sure it's 16 weeks or, I don't know, I don't remember, that was 50 years ago. All I know is it sucked. And uh, you know, the DIs had icicles in their nose, they're trying to teach you something and you're like stuck to the guy next to you because you're frozen, everybody's frozen. <laughs> it was so funny. Three pairs of gloves, three pairs of pants, it just sucked. So anyway, we we uh, we were going through this training. I remember one time we had to pull guard. I had to pull guard and uh, it was so cold. I crawled inside this five ton truck rim tire wheel rim and I was sleeping in there on pulling guard <laughs> and this lieutenant pulled up you know the the guy checking on all of us and man he woke me up and he cussed me out must have been for a half hour he said dude you'd be dead right now if you're out in war you'd be dead that's it they'd cut your throat you're out so you know you can't ever do that again so I got in trouble article 15 and all this crap and so the training seemed like it took forever here too, but it was, it was mostly classroom stuff. It, it was really boring because we already knew how to march and all that, even though you did that, we had already learned that. So now you are just learning your MOS, how to fire a um, like 105 howitzer, which, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anything in that training. Didn't learn a freaking thing. They were talking about all this stuff, you know, <laughs> Fuse quick, the fuses on the rounds, and how many of the powder powder that goes in the canister of the round and all that. We didn't pay any attention then because it was totally boring. And so we, they told us, you know, you're going to graduate, and here's the next step. You guys are going to be get orders. They give you orders where you're going: Germany, Korea, Vietnam. And at that time, nine out of 10, I'm telling you how them platoons went to Vietnam. Just about everybody automatically were ready to go to Vietnam. 
And if you got lucky, like my friend, my best friend, Butch, he got sent to Korea. And Korea, we're supposed to be on a buddy plan. We're supposed to go everywhere. No, no, just, just basic. But the, when you get your orders, you could be anywhere. So the buddy plan just basically was about, you can go through basic training together. But after that, you go where the army tells you to go. So Butch goes to Korea. Everybody else went everywhere. I didn't get any orders. So I'm sitting there going, what the heck? So Butch's day comes to take off. He's got to go home, go on R&R, &R, and then go over to Korea. So I, saw, I remember him driving off, and I remember going, this sucks. My dad just died. My best friend just got killed, and I'm heading there. Maybe. I hadn't even got my order yet, but that was, uh, that's what I was thinking. And I want to go, I want to, I want to desert. I want to screw all, I'm going to find the next bus. I'm out of here. Screw all this stuff. And so I had to wait three more weeks doing nothing because nobody was there. A few guys were there waiting for orders, but I didn't have to do KP. I didn't have to do anything. I was just sitting in barracks wondering, you know, what's up. And I would bother people, you know, the, the officers, you know, what's going on? Where's my order? So you just have to wait, kid till they decide what they're going to do with you. Nothing we can do. You just have to wait. So I waited for three weeks for them orders. And I thought I was going to go to Korea because why would I be delayed three weeks? Why wouldn't they set me to Nam with the rest of the guys? So I had no expectation to go to Vietnam. And sure enough, orders came. You're going to Vietnam on X date. And I said, oh, shoot, my best friend's gone. He went to Korea. You know, my whole life is what the H? My mother's by herself now. Everything just sucked. And so they go, okay, you get leave. You get to go home for a couple of weeks or whatever it was. So I remember going home and I start partying, of course. Screw the army. I already forgot about them. Three days after I screw that place, I ain't going back there. I'm done. <laughs> Basically, I'm going to no Vietnam. So I start deserting, man. I mean, it's going on three weeks, a month. Time's going by and people are looking. Oh, I thought you were supposed to go to Vietnam. Screw Vietnam. I'm not going there. And my, my stepdad, he called me at a barbecue after we had a few beers. He said, dude, you have to go. I don't. I don't have to do anything. I was always rebellious, you know. Screw them people. And he said, no, man, you're talking desertion. They'll put you in Leavenworth prison for 30 years. <laughs> this is big. This isn't a joke like I've been in juvenile halls and in jail a few times before this happened. And so they go, this isn't that, that kind of patty cake crap. This is prison, uh, Leavenworth. You have to go and you have to go for your honor. Your father fought. In, in World War II, I fought in World War II. I'm getting all this crap from all these these veterans, you know, saying, dude, you gotta go, man, you gotta fight for your country. Yeah, I'll fight for my country, got my best friend killed, what do I do that for? <laughs> well, go fight for him then. Oh, okay, that caught my interest again. That's why I did it in the first place, I'm gonna go fight for him. So I said, oh, shoot, I might as well go. So I decided I'm gonna go, man, I was late. Oh, at least a month. Might have been a month and a half. So I get to Oakland. My brother drives me up there, my oldest brother. And we start getting close, and I start getting a little, it's kind of getting a little real here. And so he, I remember him dropping me off there and driving off, and I'm standing there in the street in this Oakland, where we where I left from. Uh, it's a base where you you report and all that stuff, and then you catch your plane for Vietnam. I'm standing in the street with this duffel bag of army crap, and I'm going, oh, shoot, what the hell am I into here? So they go, go report here, whatever I report. So I'm sitting there waiting to go to Vietnam. I'm in this big building. Well, the big plane comes in, and it, it parks, and, and I'm sitting against the wall, I can't remember it, having a lot of memories here. And I have any friends because I hadn't met anybody yet. And I had them green, green fatigues on they give you, where they call you a cherry boy. That means you're brand new, man. You're brand new going over there. You don't know nothing. 
And then they treat you like that too. They call, they say crap to you like, hey, cherry boy, you better stay awake if you want to live and come home. The veterans say that crap to you when they walk by you. And so I see all these guys coming through this gate. And these guys aren't soldiers, man. I mean, they're not looking like soldiers. They got long hair. They got beards. Freaking right out of the jungle back in the day. They came right out of the bush and got on the plane and headed home. You know, well, they, they, you do, you, you, you go through Cameron Bay or wherever, whatever to process out, but you're still in the same jungle for taste because that's what you're, that's what you're wearing. It's not like you have, um, you know, got around my time when I came home, by then they required uh, GIs to wear the class A's, they're called. You you have to wear your nicest army suit with all your medals and all that crap. They changed all that because of the higher ups, the generals, they didn't like it. These guys are so rebellious, man. They come out, you know, just like they're off the street. They look worse than Hell's Angels. Some of them were whack jobs. I mean, they, they were like like me when I came back. Crazy, man. You get crazy over there. Not just from the war, but from major drugs. Major drugs. And I didn't know drugs before I went to Vietnam. I drank beer. I was a drinker. But man, I, I came back. I'm probably getting ahead of myself here. But anyway, them guys walked through that gate, and I was really upset then, and I'm heading out to catch that big bird for Vietnam. And that's up to this point. Um, that was it. We had to head to Vietnam. We got on this plane and they started playing movies. Why are they playing movies? Because it's 16 hour flight. And we're gonna fly to Hawaii and stop there. And, and then we're gonna stop in Guam. I think there were two stops. And man, I'm sitting there just, of course, you know, that plane's quiet, man. Everybody, nobody's visiting, talking. Probably a lot of them didn't know each other, like I didn't know them. And so we're, we're heading, back in the day when you got orders for Vietnam, you thought you were gonna die. You ask any numb vet, <laughs> you're done, you're gonna go get killed. Cause that's, you just got the wrong cards there, you're out, you're dead. And so everybody I'm sure had that on their mind, you know, am I ever going to come back? Am I going to make it type thing? And so it's quiet all the way there. It's a long, long flight with these movies playing. Didn't know what was on the movie. We were just tripping, you know, waiting to get there. And so I remember we're going to land now. And Benoit, I landed in Benoit by Ben Fook in, in the base camp Bearcat, South Vietnam. So we, we touch we touch down and the guys are filing out and we have our duffel bags and stuff. And I can remember stepping out of that plane. It was so, I'd never been anywhere in my life that hot. It was the most humid. That's why most of the infantry training in the army is in Fort Polk, Louisiana. The closest they could get to the humidity in the jungle, you know, the swamps in Louisiana and, the, and the, that kind of a um, feeling it was the closest they could get to the feeling in Vietnam. And I can remember it smelled just like S-H-I-T because it was. And we didn't understand why. Why does this place smell like crap? Literally, literally crap. And they told us the vets over there have been there a long time. Dude, there's no bathrooms here. They burn their waste. They have little outhouses. And they have these tin cans. And one of our things until I left Vietnam was one of your duties besides guard duty was you'd have to go down and burn the whole company's waste all day long for like 10 hours. You throw diesel on it and light it and have to sit there. Goes out and you can light some more. That was, that was part of the duties in Vietnam. You had to do that from the time you got there till it, well, out in the bush, we didn't do that, but. If you were in a base camp, that's how they that's how they took care of their waste. And so I'm thinking, holy, what have, you know, where am I? And so, and while you're in one of them latrines, I remember the first bathroom I went into, 
If you go into a bathroom here in the States with graffiti everywhere, that's that was it. GIs, F, the Army, you know, screw this place. ETA estimated time to get out. It had their date of when they get to get out and how many years they've been there. And this is my third tour and people's names and crap everywhere. And you're going to die. You're going to get killed. Stay out of the bush. You're going to be one of the statistics. I mean, just you're a young, young guy in a foreign place and you're reading crap like that. You're going to die. <laughs> and what the hell? And so I remember my orders were to go to a, a base camp called Bearcat outside of Ben Fook. It's kind of like a place you go until you get orders or whatever. And but you are doing something in your MOS because these little these little these little towns in Vietnam have artillery that protects them, and so. That's one of the places I went for like two or three weeks, I remember. But I, I can remember sitting there wait, waiting to get shipped out. And you had you had infantry guys, you had everything all over the place waiting for the same thing. They may have been in to the doctor and they're going back out to the jungle, to the bush. They're waiting to get flown out or convoyed out or whatever. And these dudes had like pythons wrapped around their necks. I mean, we're talking pythons, 25 freaking feet long, monkeys on their shoulders. And these were the same guys I, I talked about that came back through that, that thing with their hair long and, you know, infantry, bush guys. Men, they had animals they dropped from the bush on their shoulders, 50 cow rounds wrapped around them, grenades hanging off them. And I thought, what the heck have I gotten into? And so I'm going to tell one little episode. I saw this and there I was. Two days later, you are now in Vietnam, whether you've gotten to your company or not, you're expected to pull guard. And, you know, they're going to put you to work here or you're whatever. And, uh, it was a way to give infantrymen, they're there to rest and stuff. So, you know, they grab whoever they can to pull guard, blah, blah, blah. So I can remember pulling guard. I'd only been there two or three days. And I'm pulling guard and this guy next to me gets shot between the eyes. Gets shot dead between the eyes. And it turns out he was smoking a cigarette and a sniper took him out because he was smoking a cigarette. And to say the least, I never smoked a cigarette in the dark the rest of my tour. There was no way. <laughs> I kind of learned from that. And so I come back and I sit down and I felt like I'd been, you know, it's, it's the next day because pulling guard at night, obviously we had starlight scopes and all that. And, and I, and I'm, I'm looking at these vets that have been there. I mean, I mean, um, short timers, we call them. They'd been there, you know, probably nine months to a year. They're getting ready to go home. And I said, dude, and this guy looks at me. I'm trying to remember. He was either with, with a big red, red one or 101st Airborne. And I said, how do you freaking deal with this, dude? And he goes, you don't. He said, smoke this. And it was my first introduction to, to dope in Vietnam. And I smoked that weed and I got so, <laughs> I got so freaking stoned. I didn't know who I was, where I was, what day, because over there you're talking about what we called OJ's, opium soaked joints. We're talking about Cambodian red. We're talking about the most powerful, um, Weed you could get in the whole freaking world. Hash. They had hash from Laos. Oh, my God. They had these water bowls that you smoked it out of pipes and stuff. And so from that day on, what do you do? And he said, you don't. You go on. You smoke this shit. And you get it. You just leave. Leave this world. So from that day, from the till the time I came home, I was stoned. 
out of my mind every day. It was an everyday thing. You just went, if you, if it wasn't from a firefight, something that happened, uh, uh, ambush, uh, whatever you went through, uh, missing your girlfriend, anything, you would smoke that dope to leave reality. Because by then, you're starting to become a veteran and, and understanding, dude, you, you can't walk through here sober. <laughs> you, you can't deal with this. You know, you're going you're gonna to have trouble if you're, if you're sober. And so I'm there, I'm there learning this stuff. A week after that, of course, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Brand new GI, same place. Same place, same, pulling guard, right? And a freaking water buffalo trips a trip flare and it goes off. And I have a 50 cal in my hands. I went completely out of my mind. I am lighting up that whole freaking place. You know, I just remember I told you that I just got from a sniper, my twin eyes dead. Not me. Then I can kill me. This guy calls me up on the radio, communications. What the hell? What the hell's going on out there? What do you mean what the hell's going on out there? Hey, you can't do that. You have to call in here and get permission before you fire anything. What's your name, asshole? Told me his name. I said, you get out here. I'm going to switch you positions right now. I'm going to do your communications job and you come and sit where I'm sitting right now. Don't tell me when I'm going to fire. I'm going home after my time. If I see anything that I think is threatening my life, that son of a gun is dead. I'm going to take him out. I mean, freaking Claymores. Just lighten up this freaking place. They're not going to kill me, dude. So, say, next day, CO. What the hell are you doing? Private? I think it was a, no, it was a PFC, I think. What are you doing, PFC? What the hell do you mean? What am I? He said, you just killed 10 of the freaking South Vietnamese water buffaloes. They're down here this morning cussing me out, these Vietnamese, in their language, right? You, number 10 GI, you stupid GI, you just kill all of, you kill all our water buffaloes. And I said, oh, whoops. Maybe their damn water buffaloes shouldn't have been in front of a 50 caliber machine gun tripping the tripwire, right? <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I thought that was a funny time. So I mean, the craziness started. So, so I lived through all this. This was only like two weeks. And I get orders to go to this place called Bearcat. To all you returning vets from all wars, I'd like to talk a minute about my friend, Monty Roberts, who I went to one of his Four Cents for Healing um, meetings, and oh my gosh, did he change my life. I would recommend that for all of you guys. He's out of Solvang, California, Flag is Up Farms, and just incredible healing for me. I know we've all been through a lot of different kinds of healings, but he uses horse therapy uh, to teach you a lot of things that would help you with anxieties, fears, etc. And I would just like to put in a, a, a just, I can't put in words how much he helped me. And so you guys should look him up and go to some of these meetings and they would help you tremendously. Thanks. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts. And I have to tell you how proud I am of Dennis and Diana Nickel. They've come to our Horse Sense and Healing for Veterans. He's a non-veteran and they have a project going, surviving Vietnam. Do I wish them well? They helped us form a lot of our opinions about what we should do with our clinics for military people.
Dennis and Diana Nichol, made of gold. Look in on them.